Well, good morning. My name's David Wright. Uh, I work at the Bible College of South Australia. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, you're currently in a series uh, asking some uh, tricky questions about who God is and what he's like. Uh, and our question this morning is, is God legalistic or gracious? Is God legalistic or gracious? So what did you make of that first Bible reading from the book of Numbers? A man stoned to death for gathering wood on the Sabbath? I mean, what's wrong with that? And, and why so harsh a punishment? Should we be stoned to death for picking up the newspaper on the, on the front lawn on a Sunday morning? It's not just what's actually happening in the story that we might have issues with, though. Doesn't this just tap into our fears about who God is? I mean, when you look at what happened, it seems that God has some petty rules. And worse still, uh, he just seems so harsh. When you break those rules, God, God is cruel and vindictive. He's a tyrant who governs by fear. You know, stay in line or I'll whack you one. If you break the rules, I'll punish you. For some of you, uh, reading this story this morning might leave you feeling confused. You might be thinking, well, I know in my head that God is a God of love, but in this story, God just sounds angry, vengeful. So how do those hang together? Just, it's confusing. Is, is God legalistic or is he gracious? For some of you, it might be that reading a story like this leaves you feeling all churned up. Uh, this picture of God as a cruel tyrant, uh, this was the sort of stuff that was shoved down your throat at school. Or, or maybe you grew up in a household where you know, you're ruled by fear uh, and threat, all in the name of God. And you've been trying to escape that for the rest of your life. Some people try to deal with the complexities of this passage by saying, well, let's just ignore the Old Testament. Um, let's just focus on the New Testament. Let's focus on, on Jesus and loving people. But if all the Bible is God's word to us, then we can't really do that. Certainly Jesus didn't do that. He only had the Old Testament, so he wasn't ignoring it. And even if we did ignore it, how would you work out which bits to toss away and which bits to keep? So ignoring it just creates more problems than it solves. So this passage uh, raises all sorts of problems for us. And I'm so thankful to Rick that he's asked me to preach on it. It paints God as an angry tyrant who intimidates us into keeping his petty rules. It leaves us confused, emotionally churned up and uncertain about how we read the Bible. So what do we do with it? Is God legalistic or gracious? Well, uh, we really need God's help. So in a moment I'll pray. Uh, if you've got a church Bible, uh, we're on page 210 and 11. Uh, it'd be really handy if you've got your Bible open because we're going to work closely with the text to try and grapple with it. So let me pray and ask God to help us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you're a speaking God, that you don't leave us in the dark. So please speak to us now because uh, we admit that coming to this sort of passage we find tricky. So please may we know your voice speaking into our lives and give us faith to trust you and respond in obedience. Amen. So what's God like? Well, let's see if we can make sense of what's going on here in Numbers chapter 15. What comes before Numbers 15? Numbers 13 and 14. Yeah, okay. Um, so what's going on in Numbers 13 and 14? 
this is the section where God has rescued his people out of Egypt, he's brought them out of slavery, and he brings them to the edge of the promised land. So all that great work that our, our kids' ministry leaders have been doing for the last 21 years, this is the time to remember it, okay? Moses sends 12 men into the promised land to spy it out, to check it out. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, come back saying, it's a great land. God is going to give us this land and in his strength we can do it. So come on, let's go. The other 10 come back and say, the people in this land are too big, too scary, too hairy, they'll have us for breakfast. We cannot do this. And the 10 persuade the rest of the people they refuse to take the land. They refuse to take God at his word. They refuse to trust God that he will give them the land. And God says, okay, as a consequence of that, you will all wander around in the desert for the next 40 years. None of this generation is going to enter the promised land. It will be your children who will do it. And when the people hear this, they think, whoops, big mistake that one. Uh, we, we better do something. And so in their arrogance, they take matters into their own hands and go and attack their enemies, hoping that they'll defeat them and take the land, but they get walloped. So that's the background. That's Numbers 13 and 14. It shows God's people as rebellious and arrogant, failing to take God at his word. We then come to chapter 15 and look at how it starts chapter 15 verse 1 the lord said to moses speak to the israelites and say to them after you enter the land i'm giving you as a home and you present to the lord food offerings from the herd and the flock as an aroma pleasing to the lord whether burnt offerings sacrifices special vows free will offerings and so on and so on now isn't this extraordinary here we've had chapters 13 and 14 God's people as rebellious and arrogant, failing to take God at his word. The consequence of that is the generation will die in the desert. They'll not enter the land. Yet chapter 15 opens up by the Lord saying, after you enter the land, I'm giving you as a home. You have treated me appallingly. You have treated me with contempt. But Yahweh says, I am so committed to you I am going to bring the next generation home. I will bring them into the promised land. You do not deserve this. But I will still act for your good. I will keep my word. I will bring you home. And not only will I bring you into the land, it will be so abundant, you'll have enough for the sacrifices as well as having plenty to eat. So we move from arrogance and rebellion and its consequences in chapters 13 and 14 turn the page to chapter 15 and here is a word of undeserved kindness here is god's grace as the people look ahead they can be confident in god's grace to them if that's how chapter 15 opens it closes in a similar way as well have a look at uh, chapter 15, verse 41. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. God reminds the people as they look back, I rescued you. I kept my promises. I brought you out of Egypt because you're my people. Not because of anything you've done, but because of God's undeserved kindness. So as the people look back, they know of God's grace to them. As the people look forward, they know God will be gracious to them. He treats them with undeserved kindness. What's God like? God is a God of grace. He treats this rebellious, arrogant people with undeserved kindness. He rescues people who don't deserve it. He will bring his people home to dwell with him. God's grace is not just for the New Testament. God is gracious 
in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's not two different gods. He, he, he doesn't have a, a split personality, you know, angry and vengeful in the Old Testament, but kind and loving in the New Testament. He's always been a God of grace. You can be confident in the way God will treat you. You can be confident in the consistency of his character. As a follower of Jesus, God has treated you with grace. His grace in Jesus. He has rescued you through Jesus' death in your place. He has raised Jesus to life. And one day he will do the same for you. He will bring you home. And we do not deserve it. That is the good news of grace. What's God like? The context of Numbers 15 tells us that God is gracious. He treats people with undeserved kindness and he does that for us in Jesus. Well, if the context of Numbers 15 tells us that God is gracious, what, what about the detail of the chapter? What does that say about what God's like? Because we've still got to deal with this story of the man collecting wood. So what do we do? Well, pick it up there in chapter 15, verse 30, please. But anyone who sins defiantly, whether native-born or foreigner, utters blasphemy against the Lord and must be cut off from the people of Israel. Because they have despised the Lord's word and broken his commands, they must surely be cut off. Their guilt remains on them. God takes sin seriously. He takes any sin seriously. And here we have sin that is defiant. Do you see how in there in verse 30? It is defiant sin. Sin that is deliberate. Sin that is high-handed it's the same language used here that is actually taught used to describe israel's attitude to god when they refuse to go into the promised land arrogant defiant high-handed deliberate sin and god takes that very seriously that's verses 30 and 31 and then what do we find the very next story in verses 32 to 37 is the man gathering wood on the Sabbath. In the book of Exodus, God had made very clear to his people, keep the Sabbath day. Make it different. Use it to remember my character. Refresh yourself in me. Find your salvation, your rest, your wholeness in me. And so to help you do that, don't work on the Sabbath. Even more specifically, it says, don't collect firewood on the Sabbath so that you have a fire in your house on the Sabbath. Now, everything about the Sabbath was public knowledge. Yet, what do we find? A man deliberately, defiantly, doing exactly the opposite. This is deliberate and defiant sin. God takes sin very seriously. So the story of the man gathering wood on the Sabbath is not some random story stuck in there. It's a very concrete example of deliberate and defiant sin. What's God like? God acts in grace. God takes sin seriously. And the third thing to flow out of that is this, that God's goal is to grow a holy people. God's goal is to grow a holy people. You think, uh, you realise over the last couple of weeks, we've had international tennis players here in Adelaide and they've been quarantining. It's been our way of saying, as a society, uh, we want to isolate you, we want to cut you off, because you've come from another part of the world and we want to make sure that COVID doesn't spread amongst us. And so to make sure of that, we are going to isolate you. We are going to cut you off. You are not going to be part of us 
so that we can stop the spread. And in a similar way, God's attitude is here. He wants to stop the spread of sin amongst his people. In our story of the man gathering wood, the assembly of God's people is spoken about three times in in just five verses. It's God's people who are involved in identifying and dealing with the man. It's God's people collectively saying, we as a community, there is no place for sin amongst us. Because God's goal is to grow a holy people. God wants to grow his people to reflect his character. And God's character is holy. Because God is holy, his people are to be holy. There's no place amongst God's people for sin, especially deliberate and defiant sin. And the same thing can be said about us. Uh, As God's people today, uh, God wants us to grow to be a holy people. So in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, we read this. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Yeah. Does that mean that we should stone people to death? I, I think I saw there's a pile of bricks or something out the back there um, and, you, and you've got plenty of space so maybe after we've all had a cuppa this morning, a um, bit of activity, some strong lads. Now, we don't go around just randomly killing people, uh, that's against the law, but the New Testament does give reasons and example for God's people to exclude others. Even though people might, someone might say, yes, I'm a Christian, uh, if there's ongoing, deliberate, defiant sin, sometimes with heavy hearts, there are times where it is appropriate to cut them off from God's people. Now, that might sound all very extreme, but remember the bigger picture. God's goal is to grow a holy people. What's God like? Is he legalistic or gracious? Well, God acts in grace, undeserved kindness. God takes sin seriously. And God's goal is to grow a holy people. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, yeah, but what about this whole thing of God making rules? Um, It just doesn't really sit well with me. If God loves me, uh, why can't I just get on with living life? Well, let's think about uh, how we view life. In our society, in our culture, I determine what a good life looks like. If I find pleasure in something, then that must be good. Uh, So if I find pleasure and meaning and purpose in having purple hair or going bushwalking or eating grapefruits, whatever you're into, then that must be okay. And sin is anything or anyone that cuts across my ability to, for me to determine what is pleasurable and meaningful. That's our society. That, that's the air we breathe. That's what we think is a good life. So when we come to something like Numbers 15, it just sounds weird. But there's another way to look at life. We can look at life as... Well, God made everything and everyone. And because God is good and loving, he knows how to make life work well. So one of the big questions we need to grapple with is, as we look at life now, as we look at history, who has a better track record of saying what is a good life? 
Marianne Keyes is an Irish author. Uh, her latest novel is called Grown Ups. Uh, it's a story about three brothers, uh, Johnny, uh, Ed and Liam Casey. All three guys have beautiful and intelligent wives. They have fantastic children. And as an extended family, they're always spending time together, uh, celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, going away for the weekend together. They're always celebrating. It, it sounds ideal. But scratch below the surface, and there are lots of secrets, and lots of hurt, and lots of mess. And because Marianne Keys is Irish, she makes the mess sound funny. But it's still awfully painful, awfully messy. The history of humanity is we keep making a mess of life. When I determine what is good and what isn't, that's destructive. It's just painful and hurtful, both for me and for other people. And so, as God's people, he calls us to live his way because we belong to him and he knows the best way to live. So, how then do God's commands fit into the Christian life? You, you might be saying, yep, I'm convinced. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to put God at the centre of life. But how does God's grace and his commands fit together then? Well, the way I want to summarise it is by calling it grace fueled obedience. grace fueled obedience. Come back to Numbers 15 there. Uh, in... Pick it up in verse 38. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Now we said before, they're able to look back at God's grace and remember that he's rescued them from Egypt. They are already his people. They are already in relationship with him. God loves them. He's shown them his grace. And on that basis... God says, here's how I want you to live. I want you to remember all my commands. When I was a teenager, uh, I'd often come home after school to find on the kitchen table a note from mum that said, remember the washing. Remember the washing. Now, when mum writes, remember the washing, she's not just saying to me, oh, yes, Bring to mind that there is washing out on the back line, um, hanging there. What she's saying is, remember that it's there and do something about it. Remember to bring it in before the end of the day so it doesn't get damp again. To remember means to know it and to act on it. And that's what God's saying here to his people. Remember my commands. Know what my word is, know my commands, and act on them. And remembering those commands is based on relationship. Remembering flows out of already being God's people. Knowing him, knowing that he loves you, you love him, then remember his commands and act. Relationship first, and then remembering grace fueled obedience what's god like is he legalistic or gracious god acts in grace in undeserved kindness god takes sin seriously and god's goal is to grow a holy people so knowing that we're his people by his grace we're to remember his commands and act on them let me finish by making a couple of comments. 
Uh, first one is this. Uh, given this passage talks about Sabbath, uh, I thought it was worth saying just something short about that. Um, how strictly you keep a Sabbath uh, is an issue where Christians will land in different spots. Now, I think when you read Romans 14 in the New Testament, uh, it gives us room to move on this one. Uh, it might be that some of you keep quite a strict Sabbath. Others of you might be much more relaxed about your Sabbath. Uh, the important thing that Romans 14 tells us is that we're not to be judgmental towards our Christian brothers and sisters if they've got a different attitude or a different practice when it comes to Sabbath, if they've come to a different conclusion. Don't judge one another. Final comment. Um, how do we grow in grace fueled obedience? Well, we ask God, by the power of his spirit, to help us trust his words to us. Did you notice in our second reading this morning from Psalm 19, God's words to us were described as refreshing, giving wisdom, sweet, precious, providing warning and giving great reward. See, knowing and trusting God's words in the power of his spirit leads to grace fueled obedience. As God speaks to us, as he reminds us of his character, his grace, his conviction of our sin, his good plans, he grows us in holiness more and more to be like Jesus. So, as we begin a year, uh, a ministry year, uh, school's gone back, you know, we've got past Australia Day, the, the year is underway. As we begin a year, uh, now is a great time to either begin or to renew good habits in reading God's word for yourself. Uh, if, if you're the sort of person that reading God's word for yourself uh, hasn't been a great strong suit for you, then why not set a goal that during February, that starts tomorrow, uh, during February, you're going to read the Bible to your, for yourself two times a week. Uh, outside of Sunday, somewhere between Monday and Saturday, you're going to read the Bible twice a week. And do that for February. And if you get through February like that in good shape, then in March you can say, okay, now I'm going to try for three or four times a week. Knowing and trusting God's words to us in the power of his spirit leads to grace fueled obedience. Because God's goal is that he wants to grow us to be a holy people who will honour his son Jesus. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace to us in Jesus. Your undeserved kindness. And so we pray that in the power of your spirit, you would help us trust your words to us and so grow to be more like him. Amen.